Are you ready? Say something. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Greetings and salutations. Jacob Bush, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Gabe. Always happy to be here. Happy to be on the... Uh... This is the this is the wannabe critic podcast, right? This is the proper this is the flagship title podcast. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's to, to quote Fonzie, a guest we had on a while back. He said, uh, or just a couple weeks ago, he was like, "We're back. Nobody asked for it, but here we are. We're doing it." Um, He's back too. So He's I would back act- too. I just know I saw him streaming dude. the other day. I was happy to see that. Yeah. I've always I've always loved li- listening to them. So I'm glad they're back too, dude. They're class act super super nice guys um yeah i'm I'm glad they're back it's you know we kind of touched on it we 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 talked about maybe doing a a four horsemen episode because you are one of the founding members of the four horsemen so we do need to do that we yeah 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 so uh you know if 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 that's something that you might want to do in the future i'd be down if we can get the gang back together i'm ready i'm there um yeah, especially since, you know, we've, we've changed so much as creators. And, I mean, I've certainly changed a lot from 2020. And uh, it's just crazy how, like, fast life has moved on. You know, COVID, like, kind of messed up our sense of time. And I look back. I actually, I actually was watching that episode last week after I was, you know, editing the show with Fonz. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of crazy to just see how different things were and how how differently I conducted myself, you know, like very, very, I I just, I don't have it in me to be that try hard anymore. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like I just can't do it anymore, Jacob. So hold on, hold on. I want to, I want to unpack that more. You said, did you say try hard just now? Not with like the technical aspect, but like with my hosting, like, like, I just felt like I was so, like, so determined just to be on, like, all the time, rather than just letting myself be what I was that day. It was like, no, like, you got to be on and, like, a spaz, and that wasn't the right way to be. Dude, so. I, I, no, I, I, I love hearing that, because it's, I've gone through a similar journey where it's, you, you find your footing as a podcaster over time, and just like as a human being, you find that footing... Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I don't think it, you should look back and be ashamed of anything like that. Just look at it and be like, Hey, look how far I've grown as a, uh, as a podcaster right. and as a person. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good perspective to have though, just to see where you've come from. Yeah. It's, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like, I just put myself in my mindset back then. It's like, I thought I was like a professional back then or whatever. And it's like, do I don't even think I'm a pro- after learning a lot more. I don't even feel like I'm a professional now. It's it's just it's just funny how perspectives shift, you know, and things like that. But I, I'm happy to have you here because you're one of like uh, the only you know friends slash acquaintances, like internet friends that I've actually like been able to have, you know, a quasi like, um, what do you call it? Friendship. Yeah, friendship. But like, we keep up with each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, what would you say that word is? We're consistent. I think that's consistency. It. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we've been pretty consistent. Like, you know, every couple months checking on each other and just see how things are going. You know, it's like well, life moves fast. Like I said before, it's, it's just crazy, but I am glad you're here. I'm glad you can drop some knowledge on us and, and give us some updates on what Bush league has been up to. Uh, it's, it's, it's nasty here. It's, it's a, it's a nasty winter here. Um, in the Midwest, ask, ask me how I'm doing it with weather. Tell me, ask me, how are you doing with weather? It's 64 degrees. My window's open right now. It's beautiful here in Phoenix, Arizona. This is when I get to brag about it, right? You can brag about it different times of year. It's January and it's beautiful. I'm going to the park tomorrow for my son's second birthday. This is when I can brag. So I'm going to lean into that. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's like. Like, I, I, I can't really brag about living in Joplin, Missouri. You know what I mean? It's like, Any oh, time yeah. of the year? Is there my, ever a time? My, there, might be, there might be a time of the year sometimes. I mean, I can brag about how, like, the biggest tornado on record, like, destroyed my town. Kind of cool. You want to talk about that? Kind of cool. Talk- kinda, that's <laughs> pretty cool. It's That's a pretty cool story to tell, if I'm being honest. Okay. So, yeah, you I can't mean, brag about that. 
yeah, you, you, you kind of, I mean, it's in bad taste. It's like, oh, yeah, like, ours killed the most people. Like, ooh, <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? that's, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's another side of it. Yeah, that's morbid. That's morbid. That's, that's Anyways, right. okay. Yeah, that, nah, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, so Jacob Bush. Yes. Um, since we're kind of, you know, reincarnating, resurrecting the wannabe critic podcast, we might have some new listeners since it's a new podcast feed. So why don't you kind of, uh, give us a backstory about, um, you know, Bush league gaming and kind of how you got started and like, why are you here today on my podcast, Jacob Bush? Mm, okay. Backstory first, Bush league gaming's been a, uh, a thing we've been doing since, june of 2020 so this june will be four years which is just insane to say um but it was a spawn of the the pandemic we had some extra time on our hands and uh you know me ryan scalf nick beard uh, we decided that hey we have these conversations always unrecorded about video games and and what they mean to us and how they impact us really red dead redemption 2 was the catalyst for it is that we just talked about that game for months and just the intricacies of it and the meanings and all, all of that, the analogies there. Uh, and that was really what sparked the idea in my head of like, Hey guys, let's just record this. So we started doing that in 2020. Uh, and we still are doing it. We used to do every week. We moved to a bi biweekly schedule, um, about I think four months ago. So we moved to a more reasonable cadence for our schedule and it's far more enjoyable now. Um, the weekly thing was really, it, it became a burden and it, it didn't feel as fun. So Bush League was always meant to be fun. Um, we are all three guys that are happy in our career. So we're actually really not trying to make this a permanent thing that we do for an income. Um, so fun is a priority. We always try to come back to that. Uh, so we, we moved back to a, an every other week cadence. And yeah, we talk about video games. Uh, we review video games. Sometimes we work with publishers to get early access or just code. So we do work with the industry on that level. But we try to keep it real. Um, we understand the biases that can come from that. So we try to still stay fairly separated. But uh, yeah, we review games. Uh, Gabe, you know this. You've been on a, a bunch of times uh, regarding reviewing games. I've been on your podcast talking about games. And then why am I here today? Gabe, I don't know why I'm here today. You invited me and I said, I always say yes. I don't think I've ever said no to being on your podcast because I like talking to you. So that's why I'm here I like talking to you too. You. I like you. talking to you too, brother. Yeah, that's why I'm here. Well, and uh, the truth is, is I was in a deep, deep, dark depression and I, ha I, I, like, I was like sitting there like in my self wallow and I was like, dude, you've got to start podcasting again. Like that's why you're sad is because like you have all these thoughts and you don't get to talk to anybody anymore, really. Like, like I, I just don't, like, it was fun for me because I had the time to, like, do it weekly. And then, of course, everyone, you know, like, one by one, like, everyone's schedules started to normalize yet again. And it became difficult to do a weekly show, you know. And I was kind of the last, I was kind of the last one I was like, I have all these projects that I can work on, but I'm by myself. So it's not, I, I just got really sad because I couldn't figure all the, all, most of the projects I had built had been around, um, group content, you know? So, but Gabe, I lost, I'm you, like I lost you. you for about, I lost you for about five seconds there. Can you just repeat the last five seconds? Yeah. I was just saying that, um, a lot of the content that I had built, you know, had been group content. Mm. So like, I didn't really know. I didn't really, at that point in time, I didn't really have a passion for like doing the music stuff anymore. Like, but I, I do now. So it's, it's, it, but you, know, you it missed, full, you missed the group content. You missed the conversations. Yeah. And Gabe, yeah, let me, so here, I know we're, we're going to broach on a bit of, and I think mental health is going to come back a lot on this episode from what you've kind of preambled totally. with it. Yeah, and totally. And I think as men, men have a hard time connecting sometimes with other men right there's this macho status that you don't need anybody blah 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 right. blah blah um men have to have like community and i think if you're not talking to other guys you're not uh, you know our spouses are important and I, I can't emphasize that enough um but i think it's the compliment of your you know your spouse and also good male friendships um to really bounce ideas off of bounce what you're going through learn from each other help each other um, and it sounds like for you, at least where you are, you get that through podcasting. Um, and if that's the case, then yeah, definitely lean into podcasting. That's, that, that's to have those conversations. Um, something that 
I do here in Phoenix is that, so what Bush League really spawned from is that me, Ryan and Nick, and then also our other friend, Adam, who you also know, we get coffee every Wednesday at 6 a.m. We don't miss it ever. It's, you know, we sometimes miss. I'd say we have like a 95% success rate, but we get coffee every morning at 6 a.m. on Wednesdays and we just talk and we we talk about what we're going through. We talk about the positives. We talk about video games. We talk about the hard things in life. And it's really just, you know, we spend two, two and a half hours in the morning every Wednesday just kind of connecting. Um, and that's what I, I, I don't know. I, I, when, I, when I hear you say that, it's that kind of aspect that we really need that community in our lives. Um, and that helps right. the mental health aspect, right? It really does help when you have someone to come alongside you during a, a, a stage of depression that really helps you get through those, those phases. So, um, I'm all dude, I, I support that, that initiative. If, if podcasting is how you get that community, dude, I'm all for it. Well, yeah. And it's interesting just because our, the job we had, we don't have it anymore, but it really forced us into a team setting and, um, you know, that was something I hadn't had in years just because I had been on the farm. Like I hadn't been in a team setting for a while, but you know, you get thrown into a factory, like you can't really have like a chip on your shoulder really, because like there's a certain way to do things. And, you know, we were only there for a four, for four months, but like it, it just, I don't know. That was really helpful in me gaining perspective about needing certain people around you, you know? Um, but yeah, man, I, I, I love Bush League. Uh, we're, we're fans of Bush League here because you guys, it, it is wholesome. It's like, yeah, it's just literally the homies getting together and talking about like what they're going through and, you know, average, you know, ordinary opinions from ordinary gamers. Right. And that's that's always that's always the best ones. So that's um, the motto. because I mean, yeah, I mean, not the best, but like I feel like those are the, always going to be the most honest ones. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, um, we like to set the stage to also the fact that set, let's expect, set the expectations that these are ordinary right. opinions, right? These are just the, uh, and, and, and that's what we wanted to lean into. We, we're not trained professionals in journalism or we don't work in the video game industry. We're just your average Joes who talk about games. And if you're looking for that perspective, that's, that's what you're getting right up front. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Go listen to it. Bush league. Um, and you guys have been pretty consistent. I just listened to part of your uh, Game of the Year discussion, but I just didn't want to get spoiled on anything because, you know, that tends to happen on Bush League. There's no spoilers. There's no. There, we didn't spoil <laughs> any games. Kidding. I'm kidding. I, I'm okay. very intentional about not spoiling games. Ryan, not so much. But, yes, I, I try Ryan. to. There's no spoilers. You don't have to worry about anything there. That guy that guy so w thank you for giving us some uh, some backstory now i, I want to get into just a little bit of you know what what's what's jacob bush been up to like let's i know you're a big music guy like we know you like games but what have you been listening to recently i'm a huge music guy gabe um i've been on the verge of, of launching a, a a music podcast for the last year and a half and i just know myself and i know i can't do it right now um, I have a logo, I have a name, all of it's ready to go. It's just when I launch it, I want to be consistent. So I haven't launched it yet. But anyways, let's use that right now to talk about music. Um, the biggest thing that I didn't get to talk about last year, cause I don't have a music podcast that I, I absolutely loved was the one more time record by Blink-182. Um, Blink-182 is my favorite band. Uh, it is the perfect mix of, you know, Poppy, catchy songs with very deep and impactful lyrics, uh, ranging from, you know, really true. Like they, I think they em embody the punk rock mentality of just like, you know, do what, what you believe is right and, and stick to that and don't care what, like what I've heard them summarize punk rock is like, um, do what you think right is don't, and don't care what other people think. Right. That's like the summary, uh, throw a few expletives in there too. Um, but I love Blink-182 and their album last year was the return of Tom DeLonge. Tom's been absent from the band for the last like two records. Uh, Matt Skiba from Alkaline Trio came in and he did a fantastic job. I love those two records. Um, but Tom's back. Uh, Mom and dad are back together. Mark and Tom are back together. It's great to see. Uh, they sound great. Uh, there's, there's a new vibe to it too, right? The record has a wide range of songs. Um, and it goes literally from like boxcar racer like there's a literal boxcar racer song on the album to like a 80s synthwave song 
to traditional pop punk songs. So it really covers the gambit of the styles and I listened to it all last year. Um, what I'm listening to lately, uh, as of today, the new Neck Deep record came out uh, and I've been liking that. I've been leaning to that. That's really good. Um, I love Neck Deep. I love what pop punk is doing right now. Um, it's a really good scene. I went to When We Were Young Festival in Vegas in October and I was just blown away by the new scene, the old scene. Um, I got to see a band called Hot Mulligan while I was there. They're from the, um, the Midwest. And I've listened to them. They are considered, what did they call it? It's post-emo, um, which I'm like, that's a new genre, but I'll, I'm cool with it. They, they do a lot of, they're screaming, but it's not like too, it's not screamo. Um, and it's just really good, solid. Like they've got two vocalists, um, really solid music. Um, so really I've been leading into the, the, the pop punk, uh, the styles. There's a band, there's a, there's an artist called Petey, P-E-T-E-Y. Um, and he does a little bit more synthy indie type stuff. I've been listening to him a lot lately too, but, uh, Gabe, I love music. I'm always listening to music. I work from home. So, uh, pretty much my entire work day is cons consumed by me just blaring music in my, my office here. So yeah, I, I've never been a big blink fan, which is funny because I love all of like the things that blink has spawned, you know, and I don't, I don't dislike blink, but that's not where I started. Like I, I kind of got started with that type of music, you know, a generation later, basically. Um, so I, I can't say that I have a natural love of blink 182, perhaps like I should, you know, cause I love that type of music, but you know, to each their own. It doesn't mean, I think that I was watching a video of Travis Barker and that dude, he just, he's so freaking good. Like the, the best. I, the best. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say like. I don't know if. Uh, like, calm down. The best. I don't know about that. But he's he's very talented. He's very good. Who's the best right, drummer who's of all be, time? Hey, who's, who's better right now? No, no, no. Who's better right now? Let's say that. Let me clarify. Who's better right, right now? this very second? Josh Fries, the Foo Fighters drummer, actually. I don't know Josh Fries. The new uh, the new Foo Fighters. Tool, drummer. yeah. Tool, a perfect circle. Um, like. Here's the thing, Travis Barker, this is just my opinion, okay? Because I am a drummer. Like, I do play the drums. You're a drummer too, right? Not oh, you're not. talented. No, I can, I okay. can whistle. I can whistle. So, Travis Barker's intricate, like, very... But it's almost like... It doesn't feel seamless. It feels like he's trying to show off. He does show if off. If that makes sense. He shows and off the entire It's time. like, it's one of those things, it's one of those things that's like... Like, it's kind of like the kid on the playground that, like, keeps trying to show off. And it's like, okay, like, we get it. You know, like, you're good. And and that's that's fine. Like, I, I he's very, very good. One of the best. But I can't say that he's the best because that's fine. you don't need I'll, to, like... I, I, I don't need to defend Travis Barker. What I will say for Travis Barker, it, the only thing that I want to emphasize... You don't need to. Yeah, the only thing I want to emphasize with him is that he has been keeping... He has been fueling pop punk in the new generation, in my opinion. You'll see him featured in new rap songs. You'll see him yeah. featured in new pop punk songs. It's to true. me, he has been the most influential member of Blink-182 to keep that spirit alive within the industry, right? I feel like we went through a phase where punk and pop punk was just gone. Um, and I feel like we are in an absolute renaissance resurgence, at kind of re-envisioning of it. Um, and yeah, I, I named Neck Deep there, but there's plenty of others that are just, you know, hitting the scene now, a younger generation that, you know, old people like me basically are like, this is, I love this. This is, this is new pop punk. So Travis Barker, I think is influential in that way. You know, skill wise, I can't actually speak to skill. I don't, I don't drum, yeah. but he looks cool doing it. I mean, he's drumming he upside really down. He looks really cool. He's drumming yeah, upside no. down at these concerts. And just for the record, I'm not saying that Travis Barker is a bad drum. I am I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying he's one of the best ever, but like I just I've gotten into so many fights with like non uh civil fanboys when they try and say that he's the best of all time and it's like, dude, no, he's not. I promise you. Like he plays really hard and really fast and he does look freaking cool doing it. He looks cool. And I do have I have respect for him as an artist. Every every and he's a actual artist. Yeah. Like 
like like that stuff with yellow wolf he did and like all the stuff that he's like done the past decade or so without blink like i mean well he, again real the, to add to that he produced the most recent album like he recorded that he mixed it and you know some people we can be critical of that mix actually i think there's room to be critical of it but at the same time he is a he's a producer he makes music he doesn't just drum right he's, he's throughout the right. whole process so yeah. i really think his hand his hand in the industry is a good thing for for pop punk fans totally i totally agree with you yeah i mean i every interview i've ever seen him and he see, he seems like a legitimate artist and honestly as speaking as someone who does record and mix their own music and then it's like i don't know if it sounds good but i like it, it sounds there's good. literally not there's literally nothing more punk rock than doing that in my opinion saying like i literally did all of this and if you don't like it i don't care because i know i did everything that i i could you know yeah and it is kind of cool to like go back on spotify and like click on my songs and then see what Spotify recommends to me. Mm. You know, it, it's like a really, it is kind of cool, you know, to, to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really enjoying that. And that's yeah. honestly, what does Gabe fast radio look like on Spotify? You know, you can create a radio station based on an artist. Yeah. I want to know what right. that's yeah. like. I have your song. It's Gabe. F which one problems? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's on my rotation. It's great. Dude, thank you so much. I I'm looking that. right I, here. I put it. I put it on my on my uh, liked my liked music on December 19th, and I've been listening to it. It's so right now. I'm in a really good phase of music where I'm just, you know, when you find new music and you just listen to the new music through, right? It's like, yep. It's not shuffled. It's just new song, new song, new song, new song, new song. Totally. Pro problems is sitting right there at the 21st song right now, and I keep making my way all the way down to it, and I, I listen through it and. Um, yeah, dude, you're right there below the Steve Aoki remix of Ocean Avenue. So I, I hit that Steve Aoki, <laughs> and then problem problems comes on. I love it. Nice. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, I, I really, it's really been a cathartic experience to realize that like anything you should, anything you do make. I've been saying for years like you should make stuff for yourself first, and I never real, I, I didn't really realize that I hadn't been doing that for a long time. So it feels really good to like have a gut reaction on something or like be like no like i like the way that sounds actually like i don't want to fix i don't want to fix that like i like the human element there um, which on that note gabe i don't know if you cut this in the editing process but we just talked about how like uh, leaning into editing a, editing a little bit more and being proud of the product you put out there it lives on the internet forever and i do believe that right it's like at the end of the day you should make that content that video that short for you and you should like that and regardless of the reception because at the end of the day you're the you're subject to the the algorithm right and that is a fickle a fickle thing it makes no makes west. no sense most of the time so at the end of the day what you can control is being proud of something so you right. know be it your music be it your podcasts be it your shorts if you're proud of that then that is the that's the cathartic thing right that's that's really yeah. what the creative outlet is um, and that's what I've been trying to lean into lately too, with just getting, you know, content that I'm proud of, regardless of how it does. I think that's the most sustainable thing. And I, again, we, we talk about taking breaks and coming back to it. And to me, it's like, what is the most sustainable thing? It's not getting caught up in metrics. It's not getting caught up in how things are received. It's really, are you having fun? And are you proud of the work you're producing? I think that's the most sustainable aspect to it. It's kind of crazy. Like ever since I said like F it basically, like I don't really care. I have the best views I've ever had. Like, like literally making it like a project for myself to make these videos like entertaining for me, uh, you know, or, and just, just challenging myself. It's like, like in my last video, I did this cut of Fonz where I basically, I, I did a screen cap and then I put it in Photoshop and like kind of edited it. And it was almost like a uh, like a Borderlands villain title card, kind of, like <laughs> you know, with the way it faded in. And I was just, I was like, it, it was looks kind of janky, but like, it's like I'm so proud of that, you know, that like I, I it, it did what it needed to do, you know, it was something that was executed, and it's one of those things. It's like I'm excited to actually watch that episode now after it's done uploading because it's like I, I want to see the final product, you know, um, which oh. that was something I never. That's out now. The thumbnail. I see it, dude. That's great. I oh, is it, it out? I, yeah, I yeah. So yeah, it's, it's out. Yeah, so that'll be kind of the same vibe with you as well. You'll be number two. Which here? Full, full you, circle. Thank you, full number two. 
<laughs> Num number two. Dude, number I was two. just... Okay, two things. Make me come back to Fonz, but first, talking about Austin Powers. I was working on intros for Ethan because he was just recently on our podcast. And I'm like, I know he loves Austin Powers. So I was like, how do I work Austin Powers into it? And I just looked up best of clips of Austin Powers. And I went down a rabbit hole for like an <laughs> hour of just like the clips of Austin Powers because I love that movie so much. I never worked Austin Powers into his intro, so it never <laughs> happened. But I ended up watching a lot of Austin Powers. Back to Fonz. Um, full circle thing here. It's funny. I found you. I think the first piece of content that I watched of Wannabe Critic was when you had Fonz on back in 2020. I don't know when that was specifically or 2020 or 2021. I'm not sure. But whenever I was introduced to you, it was like first Twitter, right? We connected on Twitter. And then I think the first piece of video content I ever watched was when you interviewed Fonz. So I was acclimated to both of you guys immediately, loved your content. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just glad both of you are making a resurgence back into podcasting because I'm, I'm ready to listen to you guys. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, I'm hoping to have a handful of people that can be regulars, you know, every other month or every couple months or whatever. And um you know, Fon Fonz has already said he's down. I know you've said you're down for, for you know whenever it suits you. So that's it's mm -hmm. nice to have a, it's nice to have friends that are that are willing to hop on. You know, on a a random time just to chit chat. Um, it's nice to hear your musical journey you've had. I, I love how passionate you are because you, you speak the same language as me whenever it comes to music. And it's very rare, I think, that you have someone who can articulate like. My wife can't really articulate to like fine detail why she loves games now. Like she just has vague, vague or pretty broad, you know, um, answers. You know, she's learning how to how to express herself like in deeper ways ever since she started gaming now. But like to me, I think it's really cool whenever the way you emote uh, about one thing, it's natural for you to do the same thing with another art. So like. It's crazy how we can go from talking about games to music and the cadence doesn't change at all. So, like, I really admire you for that because it's, you know, I speak the same language, basically, and it's nice to have, which is interesting because you don't even play music and you're that connected to it. And it's like that. I don't know. Like, I just I really appreciate that. So thanks for sharing. I've tried for years of playing the piano and I've, I've memorized songs on the piano. Like if I were to pick up an instrument, it's the piano. Um, my first love of a band uh, and you can make fun of this now, but go back and listen. They hold it pretty well. The Fray, uh, piano rock, basically. <laughs> I loved right. The Fray. I was diehard The Fray. It was my first record. It was signed. Um, and yeah, if I were to pick up an instrument, if I was able to choose magically, boom, I can play an instrument. It's the piano. So I've memorized, I've memorized Coldplay. I've memorized, um, you know, Sigur Rós. Like there's, there's a list of songs that I just have memorized. So I can't read music. But I've always been musically appreciative. Um, I, I love going to concerts. Um, I'm a music first person when I listen to it. I'm not I'm lyrics last and sometimes lyrics never. Same dude. Where I can listen to Same. a record and say this is my favorite record ever and then not be able to communicate to you what the actual lyrics meant. But I could tell you what it meant to me. I can tell you what the feeling of the right. music was. But the actual word for word, I, like if someone's like, oh, do you know what that song is about? I'm like, not a clue. I couldn't tell you. I have to go back and read the lyrics. So, and and I do appreciate that eventually. When I do go back and read lyrics, and, and this is some uh, inside baseball, but again, Adam Adam Osbrooker, we were on a podcast together. He's, he's a Bush League family. And he's who I'm going to launch this music podcast with eventually. And he's a lyrics guy and I'm a music guy. So together, when we talk about music, it's like we're getting both sides of it. So I would love to play music. I love music so much. It's uh, a huge part of my life, just like games. Honestly, I would put them as equals. Um, I play games as much as I listen to music. If not more, I listen to music because it's just more convenient. Uh, and yeah, it's it's super important to me. So I, if you ever want to talk music, I'm, I'm here for it, Gabe. Last, I, just one more shout out, sorry. Uh, don't apologize. You're good, dude. You just, there's a, there's you just a band. You just take it. You just take control of the show. Okay. There's a band called no pressure. Uh, it's they're newer on the scene. They've got an album and an EP. It is the lead singer from, um, I'm, I'm blanking on who the lead singer is right now. He's, he's from, uh, the story so far. I'm not a the story oh. so far fan, but I love no pressure. And, 
uh, I found no pressure through Mark Hoppus of Blink-182 where Mark straight up said, No Pressure is my favorite band. Um, this new album I listened to on repeat on a road trip with my son. So I was like, okay, I'll check them out. It's phenomenal music. Um, on the topic of Mark Hoppus and how I found that, he has a podcast on Apple Radio called After School Radio. I can't emphasize enough. So we live in a a world today where I think it's a little difficult to find new music. You kind of fall into your Spotify liked um, playlist. You fall into your playlist and you don't really like explore sometimes. Um, and what radio used to do for you is it forced new music down your throat. You couldn't skip it. You had to listen to a new song. After School Radio through Apple Music is a radio show. It's two hours long, once a week. And they have hosts and they just play music that they're finding. And that is how I found my new music for the last four years, basically, through them. So that's my biggest recommendation, honestly, too, is that if you have Apple Music, check out After School Radio. Um, there's a podcast version, too, so you can find you can save your spot and listen to it like a podcast. Uh, and it's curated by Mark Hoppus. So, like, it's going to give you a pop punk flavor to it. But there's also, like, K-pop on it. And there's, like, rap on it sometimes. So, like, you get a wide range of music. And that's really what my taste is. It's a, it's a wide range. So, that's enough. I, I, I had a vomit music onto you for a second, Gabe. Just because, again, Bush League is pure gaming. If you want to listen to gaming content, that's what Bush League is. Music, I'll, I'll come to you for music. Dude, I love it. Yeah, no, I... I... I've I've toyed with the idea of doing of doing something similar and I've actually, you know, I put out a couple episodes of Wannabe Radio on the podcast feed and I know you you actually kind of inspired me to do the same thing because you did it and um, I've just been thinking about I've actually been quietly kind of like assembling songs like and building a library of things that are, are new to me relatively but also things that I just can't get enough of or like not like I don't know like there for a while metal specifically like I just, especially like symphonic or like melodic metal, um, I would be in and out of love with it. Well, now it's like, it's on my rotation just all the time. And I really think it helps me think. And it's like, I, 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 I like the idea of being able to sit down and talk about why I like this strange music and, or why, you know, whatever. So be on the lookout for that. You might, you might need to come on that show, Jacob Bush. Who knows? What is, we'll I'm see. sorry. So this is metal focused? It'll be like alternative focused. Um, okay. So it'll be like pop punk, metal, post hardcore. You know, there. basically all of my all of my favorite bands, like and you know bands that I'm discovering through recommendations through those bands, and you know like random songs that like you know mean a lot to me, and you know just things like that, and like being able to give commentary. It's something I would love to do. I just it's again it's just finding the time, and it's also figuring out whenever the time is right to like actually start doing it. So I'm in a similar place right now. Um, have you been to a movie theater recently? Um, probably not recently. The last movie I saw in theaters, I believe was Oppenheimer. Um, I oh, saw that's a while ago. I saw Barbie right before that. And this is as someone who used to see a movie once a week. Um, before kids. So when I lived in Lubbock, Texas, it's a very small town in Texas. Gabe, I can relate to the small town feel of, you know, what the, the small Missouri towns are. Lubbock was not much going on, but we had an Alamo draft house. So every week my wife and I would go to Alamo draft house. We'd see whatever was playing, even if we weren't super interested. So I used to be a movie theater person with kids. It's not just as, as easy. So yeah, Oppenheimer was the last thing I saw. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. I've seen it three times since then. I've seen it twice in theaters. I bought it on, on digital. I've seen it digitally. So that's my last movie theater experience. And then also, hold on, before that, it went Barbie. And then before that, I took my son to his first movie, um, which was the Super Mario movie, which was an amazing experience to first take my son to his first movie, but also share it as the Super Mario movie. And it was it was actually an emotional thing, like seeing the Nintendo logo and all red pop up on the on the screen and the, the you know the beginning of the movie. Um, that was a really cool thing. So yeah, it was like I think I saw three or four movies last year: um, Oppenheimer, Barbie, uh, Super Mario, and probably one other, like maybe a Marvel movie in there slipped in. Yeah, I, you know it's it's one of those things that I've 
I've tried really hard to focus in, you know, want to be critic on like it's it's music, movies, and games. Like that's what I know how to talk about. Like that's 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 what I, that's my life, right? And I, I just find I just don't care to go to the movies really. Mm. Um, I would if I I would if but like there's not really anything pulling me or making me want to go. And I, I think. What did you think about Barbie? I actually just talked about this with um, on Natty, her podcast, uh, Happy Hour. We talked about Barbie briefly, or maybe that's that's an episode a couple weeks from now. I don't know. Um, I can't yeah. remember. I do know. I just can't remember. But what did what, what was your what was your take on Barbie? So my take is fairly nuanced. I, I don't have just like a a baseline t- like opinion, but it's like that movie wasn't meant for me. Like I. I I recognize that that movie wasn't made for me, but I also recognize the power of that movie and also the comedy of that movie. Like, I think the comedy is genius in that movie. Um, the re- recurrence of Matchbox 20, uh, that song, <laughs> I think it's Push. Um, is it Push? It's, it's a Matchbox 20 song. It's re- recurring multiple times. I couldn't laugh harder. I love that song in the first place, but that movie's made in when I talked to my wife, we, we drove home after seeing it and sh- she cried during the movie. Um, and that's when I, I asked her, I was like, I wanted to unpack like, Hey, you know, why was that movie so moving for you? And it spoke to moms in some way too, right? It's, it's, there's a whole monologue, um, where, um, America Ferreira, I think that's her name. Um, she had a monologue about like being a mom and how the expectations of being a mom and how difficult that is. Well, my wife's a mom of two. So she very much identified with that monologue, I think. Um, so I, I took it as like, I walked in as a guy and I was like, this is funny. This there's some funny things here, but I also get that this is speaking to, um, a a predominantly female demographic, right? I'm, I'm not discounting the fact that you know, guys can identify with this movie, but for the most part, I felt like it was leaning into the, the journey of a woman. So, uh, I think that's where my take is that it's like, it wasn't made for me. I, I liked it. I was along for the ride. It was funny. I love Ryan Gosling and everything he does. Margot Robbie was great. There was a lot, really good cast. Um, so that's kind of like my, like I said, nuanced take it's, it wasn't meant for me. It didn't really move me. Like I think it did others, but I think it's a, a powerful, piece of media that is now out there for others to continually consume. Yeah. I echo a lot of what you're saying actually. And I'll be 100%. Um, I kind of scalped this. Me and my wife sat down to watch it. I fell asleep through part of it. Um, <laughs> I love Greta Gerwig. <laughs> I love Greta Gerwig. Uh, I think she's super talented. I, I, I've, I've watched, you know, like behind the scenes footage of her working with her, you know, the cast. And I just love the way she works. And I actually was really excited to see Barbie. I'm saying again, I'm going to watch it again. But I was very much of the opinion that. And and tell me if I'm completely off base. Let's hear it. But it it just felt like. And I'm just going to say this right now. I'm all for women empowerment. I think y'all like get out there, do what you want to do, like break the cycle, whatever, like be who you want to be, right? Like do your thing. Do we need to propel like the idea that it's like a good thing to like demasculate though? Because I think there's a bit of that going on in this film. And and, and I, I agree with you, like to an extent it is funny. And I do think it's good whenever you watch a movie and you say that did nothing for me. I need to watch it again, mm. or I know I'm I know I missed something like like a, a movie that makes you think that you need to rewatch it. But one core theme that I just dislike it's like you know in the day and age of an acceptance and like whatever, like there's no reason to like demasculate anyone or like or like pull anyone down to propel anyone else up. You know, which so, so I here. think it's. Yeah, and I so I I think that's a very good question because I think it's like that is probably the biggest critique that I've heard of it. And for me personally, I didn't walk away feeling that. Though I did see signs of that and there's definitely like it walks a line. To me, it was like you see that in the earlier stages of the movie where it's like Ken is just, 
you know, chasing after Barbie. He is a nothing without Barbie. That is like literally the song. I'm I'm just Ken, right? I'm uh, just Ken. Banger song. Bad, bad, bad. It's a banger. Did Come you on. did you see his uh, his reaction when at one? At so the good, Bulls, dude. He was like, shocked. He was shocked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so again, class act. Class Ryan, act. Ryan Gosling's amazing. I, I love everything he, he does. Love um, you, Ryan. But what I'm getting at with that is that let's. So I I think yes, you you picked up on a sense of that. But I think the movie developed past that by the end. What I think the movie found by the end of it was that. Hey, you know, in Barbie land, there is the matriarchy. It is woman led. It is man, you know, at the beck and call of Barbie. And then in the real world, it's the patriarchy, right? They make that very clear that it's right. the, the man run world and, and Ken's infatuated by that. He loves it. So you get the, you get the polar opposites there at the beginning of the movie. And I think the movie does identify that probably both of those are bad. And by the end of the movie, you get a Barbie and a Ken who don't necessarily need each other. They are who they are independently of one another. So yes, Gabe, you, you picked up on the fact that the Barbie land is very much demasculating, I would say. Um, but at the same time, yeah. by the end of it, I think they were able to, and, and maybe here, let me give um, your take some credit here. If you didn't walk away from that, then they didn't communicate that as well as they could have but my personal take was that yeah by the end it's like hey we can be who we are masculine feminine whatever it is independent of each other and still complement one another right we don't need to be at the beck and call of either one it's not a patriarchy it's not a matriarchy it's this complementing world um and that was my takeaway and at the same time too i'm like i'm not the most you know i, I think women have had their fair share of um in just I, I think inequality at times over the course of history i think that's pretty fair to 100%. say percent so my my skin's pretty thick to you know if you're gonna take a if you're gonna and media take guys down a few notches uh, uh sure uh water off my back right so i think also right. at that same time i'm also more inclined to be like if that did happen uh okay but my personal take was that it's the story was more like hey these are two ken it's barbie they can be independent characters and people in their own story. So um, yeah. I, I think it's a great question though, Gabe. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think too, it's, it's one of those things like I'm actually not offended by it. It's more like, okay, this movie is really, it's one of those things. It's almost like Pixar, like, yeah, it's a kid's movie, but like really there's like really a lot of messages for adults. And I feel like there's a lot of like little girls that are going to go see this movie or, or watch this movie. And some of them may be like, Oh, like, men suck actually <laughs> you know and um whatever you know it's fine if it's like I, I don't i i i would hate to think that like we're gonna live in a world where basically if you're a white straight guy you're the enemy oh wait that that's already that's right now that's like already happening <laughs> i'm just kidding shots well, fired so here, here but here but no no this is this is relevant to i think this the status of the world but yeah, um, no, and that's that's that is the bigger question. And, and to, to the movie's credit, to even be able to like segue into this type of conversation, to me, I feel like the film merits. It's it's like yeah, it's almost like for people that try and say Red Dead Redemption Two isn't a good game because it just wasn't for them. It's like no, it's actually a masterpiece. You just didn't like it. That's okay. Like you can acknowledge the greatness. The visuals. I said this on the record on Natty's podcast. Like the visuals alone. I've never seen anything like it. It's like our generation. It's it's like our generation's Willy Wonka. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, they did make a new like, Willy Wonka though. You can also. I didn't uh, see it, but I mean, wait, hold, hold, on. That's, hold on, Gabe. I want to. I'm Willy. I'm Willy Wonka. I'm sorry. But here, I'm sorry. I gave Go you ahead. my opinion. Um, did you feel that though? Like, um, obviously, I I like I got a sense of that, but I think I saw the other side of it. You walked out of that movie saying, "I feel a little bit." Uh, my back against the wall here is that what i'm hearing not necessarily i just was kind of like it was just kind of like one of those things like i watched it with emma emma really liked it actually she wants to watch it again it's not made for you um, again that's what i mean again exactly and it's i think it's more of a curiosity of i want to see what they're seeing but i'm having a hard time i want to see the deeper things that they are seeing and i also want to like 
I just want to understand it. You know, I don't like I don't like feeling like I didn't understand something. You yeah, know let what me I'm give, let me give you a let me give you a uh, analogy on the the male spectrum of things. Okay, okay. Because to all me, right, it's like right. like I said at the beginning. This I don't think this movie was made for me, but I'm happy that a, a demographic has it. Right. Um, totally. Yeah, I agree. That's if I you think it. back to classic Bond, okay, classic Bond is guns, liquor, misogyny, misogyny. <laughs> and and I'm, did you say? Hold on, did you say misogyny? Okay, I said misogyny at the delay. same time as you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> podcast delays, man. But I and yeah. I and I say misogyny intentionally here. That I, I want to emphasize that because it's like, yeah, okay. When I watched that you know, growing up, it was formative, right? In a maybe negative way, but it was like, cool. It was like, oh, masculine energy. Like it was speaking to- That's a really good point. It was speaking actually. to a demographic, right? It had its yeah. flaws, but it also was kind of empowering in a way, right? Right. Um, and I think, you know, right, wrong or indifferent, that movie was made for a demographic that found it and identified with it. Um, and I don't want to fault uh, women for having that now, right? Or people right. who identify exactly with that right. movie for having that. So to me, again, like my takeaway was that, you know, if <laughs> if you're painting men in a certain light to make this group feel really great, well, I can take that. I don't really care. Yeah. Um, but you're making them feel great and they identify and it, it brings them to tears and it's moving for them. That's great. Um, we have our things. We've had our things for centuries, quite frankly. It's true. So I, I think there's, if this is uh, uh, you know a, a new thing for a group of people, then I'm all for that, right? If people are finding that, identifying, and it's making their life better, then that's what it is. And if it's you know if it's not meant for me, then I just don't watch it. Um, but also at the right. same time, I found appreciate appreciation within it. Like I said, the comedy, the cast. I think it's a great movie. To your point, it's the Willy Wonka of our generation. It's the the production is very good. The music's very good, um, and that it's kind of my take on on Barbie. And also like. Um, I think I've, I've been able to th work through this thought a lot because I, I kind of live in a, um, a, a hyper conservative, uh, area of the country. So I get to hear like that, that side of the take on Barbie a lot. And I'm just like, Hey guys, uh, watch it. Like just watch it. It's not that bad. Uh, and if anything, it's actually kind of good. So that's kind of my take. I've actually been thinking about that movie a lot. It was, it was, it was a bigger movie for me last year. It wasn't the biggest, like I said, Oppenheimer, it was one of the biggest movie moving movies for me ever. And they happen to come out on the same day. Um, and actually I saw Barbie on opening day and I have to say seeing Barbie on opening day made me so nostalgic for what movie theaters used to be. It is the dark night on opening night. It is a, a midnight release of a film. Everyone dressed in pink. Everyone, there's an energy. There's a buzz when you walk into that movie theater. And it's sad to me now. I, it makes me sad when I see theaters today when it's just like that never happens other than that one weekend when it was Oppenheimer and Barbie, which was a fantastic weekend. Uh, but I, I love the movie theaters. I don't want them to go away. Coming back to your original question, Gabe. Um, I love the movie theaters my it's more my schedule and to your point i think also the content we're getting right now it's going to streaming right it's like you get the christopher nolans and you get the few one-off movies that go into theaters only but you get a lot of good movies at home now and at the end of the day with my lifestyle i'm going to choose to watch a movie at home first not in the theaters so i love the theaters i love the alamo draft house experience like that to me is the top line experience for a movie theater uh but i just don't get there anymore like i said i saw three four movies last year and that's that is a fraction of what i used to see pre-children yeah i mean i'm 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 i i feel really similar to you um I want to, I want to go to the theater. I want to want to, I want to be excited. Um, I think I kind of burned myself out a couple years ago when I had the Alamo draft house pass and I was going a couple times a week and I was saw everything. It was awesome. But like, even whenever I went then the theater was always empty. Like no one was ever there. And I'm like, where's the, where's the excitement? Like, where's the, where's the, like, where's like the, um, need to cover your ears so that you don't get spoiled. Like, I just, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't have much, 
I just I've fallen out of love with that a little bit. I, it would it would help if there was actually things I wanted to go see. But I'm I'm glad that you're able to get as, as you know a lot out of Oppenheimer and Barbie. I still need to watch Oppenheimer, um, and I am gonna watch Barbie again. Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> there it is. Bobby. <laughs> Do you watch H three? About... Say that again. Do you watch H three? I know H three. I don't watch him consi oh, consistently. Okay. I I, oh, okay. I just watch him when he like roasts someone on Twitter. Yeah, I, I love H3. It's it's awesome. Um, but that's a really good analogy with Barbie about 007 because it totally has... It is like the feminine version of that. Like, it's like every Bond girl dies. Like, you well, know... And like, he's with he's with three women every movie. Yeah, like, every is that movie. Is, is that something as men we want to strive for? It's like, yeah, cool. no, it's not. It's cool, but it's not something that I would like... That's not something good to encourage another generation for, right? So You're I exactly think there's right. an analogy... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I think it's okay for different demographics to have their types of movies and also to like not crap on someone else's because it's not their thing, right? We have our thing, totally. let them have theirs kind of thing. Yeah, very very well said. Very well said. Um, Jacob Bush, uh, what? Uh, let's 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 segue here a little bit to to towards the end of the show here. Um, video games. Let's do it. What have you been playing? Well, besides being... God of War, besides God of War, Ragnarok, Valhalla, we'll save, we'll, that. we'll save that to the very, for the very end and kind of get in. We've been going for two hours already. No, we're not. Yeah. No. We're on hour two. We've been, we're on hour two, bro. Oh my gosh, Gabe. Well, cut me off. I'm talking too much then. No, dude. I, I, I love it. Like the, the more you talk, like I'm just going to throw it into, you know, about Opus, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I just wanted to make sure. Cause I'm going to hold on, hold on, hold this. on. Oh, no, 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 Opus. I thought you said OBS. Opus? No, Opus. It's no. a game changer, dude. Okay, you take your it, you take your uh, YouTube link. You have to pay for it. You take your YouTube link, put it into Opus Clip, and it generates shorts for you. You do have oh. to, like, kind of... Dude, Nick sent me... I don't know if it's Opus or something similar, but Nick sent me one yeah. of those two where they, they make shorts for you. That's... Yeah. I, yeah. Are you it's a really that? nice tool. Yeah, I mean, it's. I would say it's supposed to generate ten viral clips or whatever, but I usually get five or six usable something or others, and and sometimes they're a little bit like I kind of get the gist of it. I'm I'm literally just using it just because might as well basically. Um, content is content, and I you know that's like okay. Let's the, it two does things. A, it does a it it does a pretty good job. You know. Okay. Do you want to talk about shorts first or do you want to talk about games first? Cause I think both of those are topics that I do have a bit to say about. Um, let's do shorts. We're, we're, we're segueing back. We're segueing back. Okay. So shorts uh, is shorts. Yeah. I, um, I can't emphasize enough for small YouTube creators, creators in general, how important shorts are for them. Um, we live in a short form content world now and a podcast isn't going to grow anymore on YouTube. Um, if you don't try to lean into that short form content, YouTube is pushing shorts. TikTok is TikTok. It's short form content. Instagram is reels. These mechanisms for entertainment are what is on the incline. A long form podcast is not going to be found like a short form piece of content. So if you're not making shorts, you're not making TikToks, um, it's going to be very hard to grow a podcast. And I found that over the last four years to be the case. Uh, we had one short to go viral. It resulted in our biggest influx of subscribers. And since then, when I make shorts, we get subscribers. When I don't make shorts and I just put out the podcast, we don't get subscribers. It's just as plain as day as that. The more shorts I make, the more subscribers we get. End of the day. Like that is as factual as it is. So to me, I can't encourage enough. If that means using Opus to get more shorts out there, because at the end of the day, the more you make, the more likely you're going to get eyes on it, the more likely you're going to find a viewer. And that is what I've been doing a lot lately. I have to have the enjoyment to do it. It's It takes time and work to actually make these. Uh, Opus makes this e easier, I imagine. But for me, it's like if I make a short, it's going to take me one to two hours to make a short that I, I'm actually proud of. So one to two hours, and sometimes that results in, you know, 200, 500 views. Sometimes that was, results in 9,000 views. Sometimes that results in 
you know, one time seven, 700,000 views. So like there's a, a wide range here. And I think for a podcast forward, you know, uh, network channel video, the short form is how you bring people into the door. And then the podcast is actually what keeps them around. So, um, that's my two cents on podcasting. I'm very big on shorts right now in the last, in the last 19 days, we've probably put out eight shorts, seven shorts, maybe. And, um, the, the fruit of that is like very clear when you look at analytics and again, coming back to like the fun aspect, analytics is what is not fun. Analytics aren't fun when it comes to making content, but what's fun is making content you're proud of. And like shorts is one of those things that I really get a joy out of like, okay, how do I cut this? How do I chop these things up? How do I add whatever here? Um, so that's my take on shorts, Gabe. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but I really like making shorts right now. Um, and I think it's, I encourage any small creator to lean into making shorts if they're looking for growth. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that because your success actually, you know, I, I saw, uh, you know, cause I, your guys' stuff always comes on my for your page on all my platforms. So, which I always like, of course, cause I'm a good guy and it's actually good content. Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw that you were getting really good traction. It was like. Well, I mean, I might as well try it and being able to find this Opus tool, you know, I have a lot of old podcasts, so I've just been loading those in and seeing what, seeing what I can get, you know, just to kind of get all that stuff out, out there. Even if it's not that great, it's like, it, it's fun to look back and see some of these older things. And it's like, oh man, I forgot about that. You know, it's, it's been a true joy. And I, and I agree. Um, you know, I, I think if you can post once a week consistently, um, you know, I have multiple projects and I'm not able to really post once a week on all of those, but I try and make something once a week. And I just have a new rule now that if I have that one piece of content, it's going to have at least one piece of short form content. And if you can do that once a week, um, any top tier creator you ask, if you ask them that strategy, like, will that be good once a week for each of those, you will, you will find success eventually. Yeah. Um, cause consistency is going to be consistency is going to beat everything else at the end of the day um for sure so you know it's like and when you think about it in terms of like oh i'm gonna post this thing to get views it, 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 rather you know you don't want to think about it that way you want to think about it like i'm gonna spend this time i'm gonna have a podcast i'm gonna have like a piece of a couple pieces of short form like i'm gonna have multiple pieces of content out of this time that i just spent um and it's it's just a really satisfying loop. So I, I can I can echo that sentiment. It's been fun to kind of go down that shorts rabbit hole. So thanks for talking about that. Yeah, um, sure. So yeah, let's 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 talk about games now. Uh, we're saving, like I said, we're saving God of War, Ragnarok, Valhalla for the end. Um, what else? What have you been playing besides that? You play so, a lot of games, Jacob Bush. Like I play a lot of the 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 way you can. How do you beat your game? Like, do you just focus on one at a time and yeah. just blitz through it? Basically, do you play on easy mode by chance? No, always medium, regular, standard, whatever it is. I, I Nick is the easy mode guy on Bush League Gaming, so we do get that perspective, and uh, I try not to shame him because it, whatever it takes to get through a game. Honestly, for, you want to see how good a game is? Play it on easy, because. The, the flaws will be exposed pretty quickly, in my opinion. Like, I tried to go back to Ratchet and Clank 2016. Sure. And there was literally one part where I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I, I was playing it on easy. I'm like, yeah, I'm not wasting my time getting frustrated, I did, actually. I did that in Starfield. I dropped the difficulty for one mission in Starfield and bop, popped it right back to where it was. What I will say with difficulty, briefly, is just that I want to play it how the developer intended it. So usually that's medium. That's regular. Whatever it is, I want to play how right. the developer intended it. That's what my goal is. Um, how I play a lot of games, um, evenings. Uh, I've got a wife who understands that this is an outlet for me. Um, she's very supportive of this outlet for me. But yeah, so 2023 was, I think, for me personally, the best year in gaming I've ever experienced. Um, the caliber of games we got, the quality that we got, the quantity that we got is uh, unmatched. So, you know, right now, currently, I'm actually playing through Cyberpunk 2077 for the second time uh, via the new update with 2.1, the Phantom Liberty update. 
it's fantastic. I literally well. download, I downloaded, I re-downloaded the game based off of your guys' recommendation. So I'm going to dive into it at some point. I don't know when, but I do have yeah. it downloaded. So that's that's what I'm playing right now. If I'm going to back up from there, because that's not really recent. That was, what, 2020, 2021. Um, backing up from there, it was Valhalla. And then going a little bit further back, it was like Baldur's Gate was really what was consuming me from pretty much October through December, I think, was really what I played. Um, you can throw in Starfield in there. You can throw in Tears of the Kingdom, Spider-Man 2, all of these games. You know, when you look back at our Game of the Year list, um, I played everything pretty much on that Game of the Year list. And um, I played pretty much the, 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 the highest ranked games last year other than Alan Wake 2. And that was strictly because I just, I'm not a fan of that genre. Also Resident Evil 4. I don't do the survival spooky horror games very well. It's just my personality type. It genuinely scares me. Um, so I don't play those games, but for the most part, I've played, I played the back catalog of last year. Um, Marvel Snap, I talk about it way too much, but it is <laughs> the most consistent game I've ever played. And it's probably the game that I put the most hours into any game ever also. So that's me gaming right now. That's where I've been at. So you played Baldur's Gate three. I got to. Uh, I had to um, turn my video off for just a second. But um, what uh, what was your Baldur's Gate three journey like? Like, tell me about your class. Tell me about like. T give me the rundown of like how you decided to play Baldur's Gate three. And have you are you, have you just played it once or? Okay, I played it so once. Give us the rundown. Yeah, I played it once. I started it at launch. I felt like I I basically started due to FOMO. I saw the reviews. I saw people talking about it. I bought it and I hopped into it. I played about five hours, thought it was really good, liked it a lot. Um, I started a kind of like a archer type class. Um, my character's name was Strider and he was a ranger, if you get the <laughs> reference. Um, and I dropped off when Starfield came out, right? So Starfield came out on September 5th, I think that sounds right. And I played Starfield through, love Starfield. And then I was like, you know what? I, I know I need to come back to Baldur's Gate. So I came back to Baldur's Gate and really gave it a full try. And it's it's that game, you know, like Skyrim. You talk about Skyrim and what that meant for you as a staple formative game in your repertoire of experiences. Right. Baldur's Gate 3 is that for me now. It is the gold standard for an RPG. It's the gold standard for a turn-based game. Um I will compare every game to Baldur's Gate 3 moving forward, and I can't recommend it enough. It is a very intimidating combat style, but if you can push through that and learn it and make that effort, it is one of the most rewarding experiences you'll have in games because it is Skyrim, what it was at the time was like, man, I can do anything. There's so much choice. But at the end of the day, it was the illusion of choice. It was, uh, you know, you can't kill that person because that's a main character in a quest line if they die you ruin the entire game for yourself they stop you from doing that baldur's gate doesn't stop you from doing that baldur's gate allows you to to kill a companion that is a critical companion for a storyline and that storyline just doesn't happen for you so when it comes to like i think leaps for the video game industry baldur's gate 3 is i think one of the biggest leaps we've ever taken um in gaming. So that is my Baldur's Gate experience. I can't recommend it enough. I loved it. I played it on PC. Ryan's playing it on, on PS5 right now. Nick's playing it on, on Mac right now. And they're loving it also. So that actually, you know, spoiler alert, Gabe, that got our game of the year for Bush League. Um, that was our number one spot. Okay. So, I mean, explain your play style. Like, how, were you a good guy? Were you a bad guy? Did it, was, you know, was it kind of a crapshoot? Like, you know, because I... I, um, I'll tell you about my character really quick. So I love RPGs. I love DMing, you know, tabletop stuff. I love t storytelling. We have literally a podcast called Storytime, a Star Wars RPG podcast, um, which we are, we are still working on it. It's just back burner, like many of the things at WBC. Um, but I am playing as a halfling bard. Nice. And it is one of the funnest uh, things I've done in a video game. I, I, it, you ever start a game and you're like, wow, I love this. I need to put this down though until I can like really dive in. 
that was what I said with Starfield. I played it and I said, yeah. I have to, let me, let me give Starfield attention and then I will play Baldur's Gate. Yeah. So yes, I totally, that's kind of how I, yeah. So I, same thing, me and my buddy game share. So like we, we had the, I have the entire catalog of last year too, basically. I just haven't gotten to all of it. Yeah. You know, just life's been in shambles, but, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, so yeah, tell me about your, your character. Like what, like what uh what, what is his how does he feel about like is he is he just trying to do what's are you a good guy bad guy i mean like yeah g- give me sell me and let me just call it real quick ryan is a halfling um monk so you guys are in similar spheres there right <laughs> that's um, awesome i chose and I'm, I'm blanking on what the actual like race was but I, I chose like the human whatever the human was like the the traditional human and he's archer um, in every RPG, I always play through as myself first. So I try to make them look like me. I try to make good choices that I would make as Jacob. Um, so I played it as a, a nice guy. I, other than my name being Strider, I was playing it as Jacob. Um, so it was good choices. I really, really want to go back and, and play a, uh, an evil run just to see the different outcomes. Cause I know I know the differences in these outcomes from what I've heard from people, and I want to see them for myself. So, in general, when I played Knights of, Knights of the Old Republic for the first time through, it was light side, good guy Jacob, um, and just like Baldur's Gate three, I was a, a good person making good choices here, uh, and that's just that's how I play games usually for the first run. If I play a second time, it's usually the dark side just to to experience that. It's so interesting, you know. We talk about the concept of replaying games. One of my my best friends, Jace, uh, he will not like. Very rarely will he replay a game. Whereas if I find a game I really like, I I I can't let go of it. Like I will mm. not move on. Like it will be something I always go back to. Like like I will literally just hop in Red Dead to play for a week or two. Like just pick up where I left off. You know, it's like same thing with Skyrim. I'll pick up Skyrim for like a week or two, and like be super into it. And then, you know, move on to something else for a while. But, like, Baldur's Gate literally seems like you can just have, like, a whole second life, you know, um, with all the class abilities and just everything you can do. It's crazy. It's it's interesting, though. If you try and go back to... Did you play any Divinity, really, ever? No. Didn't touch it. Nope. So, Divinity is way harder, It you know, um, in my opinion. But that same Larry and Flair, it's like... You, your imagination is the only thing holding you back from, from many of the things. Um, so yeah, you, you, cyberpunk, you know, is the big, you've been playing any racing games at all. I mean, anything else that you can mention? Yeah. I touched Forza motorsport. Uh, we reviewed that with Ethan just cause he's the sim racer. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. We did not review that with Ethan. We reviewed that with George. Um, Ethan was, a he was in the sphere of being on, but we got his feedback for it. Cause I know he likes sim racer. So that was the biggest thing I played last year for racing. I touched on, um, Lego. What is it? 2k racing, whatever that was. Yeah. Me and my son played that. Um, he's four now and he loves Lego. So that was, and he loves racing games. He loves Forza four. Uh, so I'm sorry, Forza horizon four. Um, so he likes racing games. So I did play that a bit last year. Uh, and I, I do circle back on Horizon 4 just because me and my son play that. But no, I did not touch on racing games. Um, do you have Gran Turismo 7? No, I don't. Funnest racing game uh, on consoles right now. Like it's not a even sim. A it's a sim racer, right? It's it's a sim, but dude, it the adaptive triggers like yeah. it adds a whole new layer of sensory that I've never experienced before. Like. It's the type of game that's like, if you were ever to say like, man, I love cars. I just suck at sim racers. I would literally give them Gran Turismo 7 and put it on the easiest difficulty because I'm I'm having so much fun with it. I love, I love cars. Like I genuinely like that is, I love cars. I used to have a Mustang. That was like, I, that was my identity, unfortunately for a long time. Um, (laughs) But in general, I love, I love cars and I, that outlet now is through games, usually the arcadey games, but I've always played Forza uh, Motorsport. Every iteration I've, I've played each one, I've owned each one. Um, so yeah, I've Gran Turismo's, I've never touched a single one because I've been in the Xbox ecosystem, but I have a PS5 and I've been debating hopping into Gran Turismo. If it goes Dude. on like PS Plus, that's when I'll probably try it. Um, I hear you. 
Yeah, I bought but it, it on good. sale. I bought it on sale for Black Friday. It was like thirty eight bucks or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm 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 I play it every day almost. I, I love it. Um, Dang. Okay, I'm about to get to check it out. Yeah, I I mean because it just it makes it so easy like to play every day because it kind of keeps track of like how much you've at the end of each race you have like a daily marathon thing and it's like sometimes I want to fill that bar up all the way it, it, I don't know I just it gives me I, I'm in a backlog uh, mode right now and I, I have this thing like in a way it's been really cathartic and healthy and it's interesting like I'm starting to understand why people like Elden Ring because I've been playing that almost every single day for the past couple of months, very little at a time because I hate Souls combat with a passion. But everyone tells me about how good this game is. So I'm going to beat it. But I'm telling you right now, it's not as good as y'all been saying. Like, it's good. But it's the not, best, I can't the say... Best game in, the best game of 2022. What else came out that year? God of War Ragnarok. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, the combat alone in God of War, like, there's endless fun to be had there. Like, I'm sorry. I just... I need to be Elden Ring first, okay? I'm 46 hours into it. Oh, um, my gosh, dude. You're, I, you've got... You've, you're maybe halfway through. Okay. that's That That makes me happy because I'm, I'm in a struggle. Like, here's here's how I'm approaching it, okay? I will not look anything up on a video game um, unless I absolutely have to. Well, Elden Ring, it's kind of pointless. Like, you might as well just wander and play the game your way, in my opinion. Um, yeah, don't totally. And that's been really fun. That's the way to play it. That's the yeah, best way to play like, it. Like, yeah, that, so that's how I don't look anything up. Like, don't do anything. My A friend of mine, my brother, actually, he texts me. He's like, dude, Gut Sword is in the game. He, he sent me a picture of, like, the general area, and I found it. So I have that sword um, now, but... I've been going through my backlog and I've set a routine for myself and it, it started with I need to play Elden Ring every day. I just need to play for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to get my runes. Like I, I have a rune farm that I do every day to like bank runes. And um, so I've been I've been making myself play and I, I almost get it every day. So just like that habit of doing that to make those runes has kept me in a routine. So it's like while I'm sitting down to play games, it'll be like I make a list. It's like, what do I need to get through? For a while, it was like, okay, I need to play Elden Ring. I can play Gran Turismo. I can play Mario Kart, the DLC there. And, oh, Valhalla. Like, that's like an hour of gaming time there, you know? And I'm making progress. And it's like, I've been doing that, like, four or five games at a time. Like, I'll just play for 30, 45 minutes on each one. And, like, I've been completing multiple games at the same time, even. So See, it's been kind of, I don't you ask, you, know, you, ask me, you ask me the question of how, I, how I'm beating games at the, at the cadence I am. I will not start or touch usually more than two games at a time. Uh, and, and that keeps me somewhat almost accountable and it keeps me somewhat driven to get to the next one. Right. So it's like, man, I really want to play that that new Prince of Persia game. Well, first, I want to wrap up what I'm doing here. Right. And, and, and honestly, that is the side effect of running a podcast. It's like, I want to be able to talk about talk it. about this game in a timely manner yeah. so if i'm gonna do that i need to pace myself right it's like if i spread myself too thin to your point it's like you will com you will complete games at the same time but it might be like more far more spread out than it would have been if you just focus on one at a time so uh, there's yeah. two methods there and i honestly i try to tell the other guys of the podcast because my discipline for it is what I only want for myself. I don't want to push that on anyone else. So it's like, yeah, hey guys, take your time with Baldur's Gate, right? I, I beat Baldur's Gate uh, almost two months ago. And I'm telling them like, hey, take your time. I don't want you to rush this amazing experience. So I don't want to also push that on the people. If, if you're asking the question of how I get through it, it's like usually I my motivation to get to the next game is finishing the last thing. Um, and I actually didn't do that before podcasting. That's really much a podcasting discipline that i found um and again i'm not necessarily saying that's for everybody but that's just that's how i do it right now yeah i i had a completely different approach where it was like and i still have that approach i'm, I'm getting more disciplined because i now have a ridiculous pile of shame that i need to at least get through to some degree and let's be real every game you buy you will not enjoy every game you buy um no. so no. i have like a 10 hour i have a 10 hours i have a 10 hours rule it's like before i'm done with the game i need to at least put 10 hours into this um, 
I like that. You know, I think I think about how much money you make, you know, per hour, and I'm like, that's well over, you know, what I would have paid for the game. And I usually don't buy the games brand new. I usually wait on sale. So I'll I'll buy games in bulk on sale, and that's what happens because I want to try everything and like be able to talk about it. And but yeah, it's like you kind of fall into that thing. It's like unless you're gonna podcast every week and like do the thing, it doesn't really make much sense to have all these games. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting, but. Yeah, I I really admire people that can have that discipline because I don't have it right now, but I am getting better by doing it my, you know, the way I'm doing it right now. It's like, no, like I play these games and like I'm making progress and I like making progress. And to some degree, I think for a game like we're going to segue into it right now, a game like God of War Ragnarok Valhalla, it really does um add to the experience to play it that way where I just kind of would play one or two runs a day basically um and if I you know went to bed and like I returned to it the next day it really gave me like an added effect like whenever you wake up as Kratos on the shore it's like oh yeah what am I doing like I gotta I gotta go back in here and you you know you kind of you kind of feel like almost like you're in a dream a little bit because of the way that game is set up totally um and yeah I I uh I just beat after a few weeks of, you know, attempting, you know how I am. Like I still haven't beaten Hades. I need to beat that at some point, but I, I, I have a hard time. I think I accepted it. I'm just not that good at video games, but I That's love video fine, games. Dude. That's fine, dude. I don't, That's I don't, good I, thing I to accept. Yeah. I don't know that I'm actually good at video game. I'm really good at destiny. Like, don't cross me. I'll hurt you. <laughs> but like video games as a whole, it's like, uh, it's been nice to kind of challenge myself where it's actually fun to do so and god of war is a great a great game for that because valhalla i just want to say this for the record i do not appreciate violence in video games i think it serves very little purpose um Mm. in a lot of ways like i i don't i don't enjoy i don't enjoy violence as a whole it is a mechanic a core thing that you have to do in this type of game it's inevitable. It's called God of War, but Kratos literally does not want to do it. Yeah. Um, and that's probably why he's become my new favorite character of all time. Mm. So I'm just going to say it now. If you haven't played God of War Ragnarok Valhalla, this is your last chance. Spoiler warning. We are going to spoil the piss out of this game. All right. Yes. The piss. You know what I'm saying? That's my Jack Black impression. <laughs> okay. I like that. So, that was a good Jack Black impression. I feel good now. <laughs> um, Jack Black is... I love Jack Black. I do too. He's the man. So God of War Rag- Ragnarok Valhalla picks up right after the events of Ragnarok. Atreus is no longer with Kratos. You're solo. Um, and this was pitched as a, a roguelike experience. And I remember seeing it and being like, oh, that's cool. You know, that, that's... That's that's a really good way. It's like, I, great, you know, I have something to go back to. I love that game. I'm, I still need to go back through it on New Game Plus. Um, so I was excited. So I jumped right into it. Uh, and then quickly realized that it is definitely way more than what it was pitched as. Um, God of War Ragnarok Valhalla is its own game. It is a standalone experience. Um, and... I think I actually enjoyed Valhalla more than Ragnarok. Now, mm. um, I need to go back through it again. I need to go back through Ragnarok again on New Game Plus, like I said. But I really was drawn to this this narrative here um, in Valhalla. And, you know, just to kind of, if you haven't played it, I'm just, and you're listening still, basically, Kratos has been invited to Valhalla. And there's a lot of mystery around it. Like, no one really knows what it is and what its purpose is. It just kind of has personal things attached to it that you have to traverse. The deeper you go into Valhalla, the memories of your past mistakes, you know, things that evidently are recalling, you know, you're recalling them to your memory and you're having to confront them whether you want to or not. So, very quickly, we realize Kratos is going to have to be reliving key moments of his past life. And the things that he's done. And he is giving commentary on the things that he's done. He's fighting enemies from the past. He's having to like take on like like Greek mythology, uh, you know, um, 
monsters and and foes and things like that and it's like you know we got a new rage mode uh you know that's the giant sword that kratos was killed with you know in the last the, his last life or whatever and like they just did so many fan service things like and i'm not even a, a huge og god of war fan i always thought Kratos kratos was an idiot like you know like i just didn't really it wasn't really my thing you know mm. but for those of uh, for those of uh, you know those of you who do love Kratos in that those older games, this is acknowledging all of what he's been through and and tying everything up and giving us a glimpse of what we could see in the future. Mm -hmm. And the, the director of the game already came out and said, like, do you really think that was the end of the story? Like, come on. So, I mean, I love the idea of having to be confronted with your former self and you're having to confront and actually move on. And I think that's the base of what Valhalla is, is we hold on to things. We lose hope for ourselves, like who we are as people, like deep down inside, like we keep trying, but like we know we actually don't have any hope sometimes. Mm. And I feel like for these past two games, that's where Kratos has been. He's had no, the boy has been the only reason. And, you know, we learned that Tyr, who is relatively absent throughout God of War, uh, Ragnarok. Can you hear me still, Jacob? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You just looked frozen. No, you're he good. was, you know, I, we, we learned in Ragnarok. Spoiler alert for Ragnarok. Um, we think we're, we're encountering Tyr, you know, in Ragnarok, but it's really Odin. Odin's been disguising, you know, so I was kind of bummed because we didn't get to actually get to, to meet Tyr. Well, this, this rectifies that. And Tyr is actually the one who invited Kratos to Valhalla. And Tyr has already been on this journey. He has already done the work. He has already gotten through it. And each time you get to the end of Valhalla, you fight Tyr. And he's basically helping you overcome things that you're, you know, it's like he's helping you let go, basically. Mm -hmm. And what to, what, you know, I don't know what's cooler, you know, than two Greek, myth, you know, mythological gods fighting each other and basically trying to tell each other like comfort each other like hey it's gonna be okay and that's what i love about greek mythology is that it acknowledges the human element and and things that we desire like what we desire in our natural progression kratos was a guy he was all he cared about was pleasure in himself selfishness he acknowledges at the end of this experience that's exactly what he was and i i was like getting teared up because i was just, i just couldn't help but get flashes of like when you go through your social media and you scroll and you see things from years ago or even things you've created from years ago and things that seem like they were just yesterday right and you're like oh my god and you're able to place yourself in those those times and those things and the things you were going through and it's like everything comes full circle now and you can see like what 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 was the cause of x y and z and like everything starts to make sense and like eventually you can let go mm. and at the end of this experience in valhalla because you have to keep going through like the first time you actually beat tier guess what that's not the end of it you have to you have to earn it like it is a true you earn every step of this journey but it was super satisfying being able to see the end and see kratos be actually like accepting the fact that you can't be a lone wolf your whole life and expect to be happy. Who knows what Kratos would have done to himself. Like if he had been alone for an extended period of time. Without the boy. You know that's a guy who hasn't had a, a great mental health streak for a long time. So <laughs> it's like. You know what I'm saying? I mean I'm being totally. realistic. Like God of War speaks to these really deeper things. And like these deeper narratives that we have to deal with on a day to day. And seeing it from Kratos' experience and being able to see him let go and accept that like he only was able to do it because of his friends it like helped me realize like dude like you have got to like you have got to like lean on people more because like it's okay to accept help is what i got out of it and it's okay to get that hope back I, when that trophy popped and it said god of hope i was mm. like oh my god dude like chills and it just, it made me so, it just made me, because we're both men of faith, right? And on paper, I guess there's a lot of things. It's like, oh, well, if you're a man of faith, like you shouldn't be enjoying this, this, this thing. But 
if anything, it, it's helped me to appreciate my my faith more. Like, because I've, I've I feel like I've experienced an emotion that I've never been able to experience before, and I do believe that by design we are created. Everybody needs to have these types of experiences that can make us feel these these types of emotions to help us remember what is actually important. And I just feel like that's what Valhalla like. It just really deeply impacted me. Like I just, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but I mean, what what was your thoughts? I, I texted you and I joked. I was like, "So God of War Ragnarok is better than Hades," which you quickly, you know, said, "No, it's not." But whatever. So, man, you you touched on so many things that I agree with, and I I loved your synopsis of it. But you avoided one word the entire time that you described it. Um, but I think that God of War, Ragnarok Valhalla is therapy. It is, it is ah. the, it is the core of what therapy is. And coming back to what you're, what you're emphasizing here, Gabe, about leaning on people and how that's hard and how Kratos is probably the embodiment of overly macho masculine traits that are negative. Like he is toxic. He was toxic masculinity, right? not the biggest fan of that word uh, because i think it's reductive but he is the definition of that he was that definition uh valhalla is therapy you you said this just now gabe you said he was putting in the work there's a chapter called the work what that is in like the realm of therapy putting in the the work means something it is tackling the hard pass it's tackling the mistakes you made it's confronting the it's confronting the dark side of your history of who you are head on that is the work because you can't move past it until you do that kratos is doing that in god of war ragnarok valhalla that is what this game is it's therapy for kratos it's therapy for who he used to be and it's cathartic for us as people playing it as going like hey uh kratos was the worst human you could be in in real life terms right you don't want to be anything that he was and you see him to be fair to be fair he killed his his wife and his daughter got tricked into killing his wife and his daughter and then was literally not allowed to die so yeah i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. you know get sure get, just he just killed a lot a of people my, my, I think a lot my core here, a my lot core, of people the, yeah. the the point i'm making is he killed a lot of people and I think what you get to see as this mature older He's, Kratos yeah, is it, unredeemable. Like I, it, I was just saying, like I, I view young Kratos as unredeemable, and it was fitting mm. that he died at the end of the original run of God of War because he was unredeemable. He served his purpose, and the, he balanced the scales basically. Mm. Like, and it's it's sorry. worth noting, I did not play anything before 2018 God of War. I've never touched a God of War game before that. And it still had that same impact for me because I think the developers showcased it very well. But to me, it's it's a great testament and it's a good reminder for doing the work. And I think it's really important for people to experience and, and see that like, hey, this terrible character, you know, in, in air quotes, terrible character, did the work and he made it to the other side and he's a better person now. And he now can lead people and he's in a good spot mentally. I think there's so much to take away from it. And going back to your point about how this is a medium that's maybe not appreciated, just call it art. I think I think communities recognize and value art, but usually it's traditional art. It's a, a picture. It's music. Sometimes it's a movie. It's a TV show. A video game is still has a lot of... Um, there's still a lot of kind of preconceived notions about what video games are and they're not fully respected as art but if i'm ever not feeling uh like i can talk about something or feel something right i remind myself that a video game is art and art is meant to move you it's meant to remind you about people it's about to remind you about spirituality like you said these things are all connected and uh valhalla is a great reminder of it, going back to the beginning of this episode gabe community and um you know, leaning on others and not just thinking you're this one bastion of, um, uh, you can do it all on your own. Like, I, I think this is a really good summary of the power of art. And when I think back to the gameplay of it, 
I think the story of Valhalla is better than Hades. I struggle with the gameplay as a roguelite because it's a bad roguelite because you get all the powers already. You beat Ragnarok. You had all these abilities and now you have to go back and play a dumbed down Kratos who is not powerful. And now all you're doing is trying to get back to where you were and you get back to where you were or close to it to get knocked back right down. To me, a good roguelite is, man, I've never felt so powerful this run, and I can't wait to keep going as far as I can. God of War Ragnarok, you are as powerful as you'll ever be in Valhalla throughout the last third of that game, and in Valhalla, you're a weaker Kratos. That's my biggest gripe from a gameplay mechanic. Story-wise, Gabe, I agree with you. It is phenomenal. It is unmatched. It is, it is making therapy approachable it's making therapy not there's not so much stigma around it uh and it's it's tackled by the perfect character to to break down that stigma so that's that's my take on valhalla i'm so glad i get to talk about it um uh, the guys on bush league haven't played it. i don't think they're gonna play it because they don't like roguelites that much but uh it's a phenomenal experience i can't recommend it enough yeah i i, I echo a lot of the same sentiments you're saying and um you know it's interesting because I'm the type of person, whenever something happens from a gameplay perspective, I have to know why. And I think that's one thing that Santa Monica does a really good job. It's like, well, we need this this weapon to do this thing because of X, Y, and Z, and da 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 And like, you know, they give you these... Like, there's no way to advance the game unless you get those things, you know? So in a way, it's, it's like a linear, like, Metroidvania in a way. It, like, makes it... It kind of reminds me of like the old, like uh, the newer Wolfenstein games too. Like you're kind of always getting stuff up to the end, sure. which uh, I kind of like. Um, but I'm the type of person. It's like, well, yeah, Kratos is weaker. Why would he be weaker? What's changed? And it's something we touched on earlier. He doesn't have a son with him. Mm. The only thing he's been focused on, literally the entire like, since we've seen him in this iteration. First, his wife died who he was obviously, like, super into. And now all his focus is put on his son. You have sons, right? Two. Yep. You, you, would you say you lose a little bit of focus or, or lose a little bit of your edge at times whenever things come, you know, something comes up with your kids or, you know, whatever, like, maybe you don't handle X. I mean, you seem like a pretty, like, organized guy, but I know for me, like, I put myself in Kratos' shoes. If I... And it, maybe this does come from, like, my mom leaving us, and it was just me and my dad, you know, for, for so long. Uh, you know, over those few years, it just felt like a long time. So, again, another thing, like, another another key event in my life that I gravitate towards. It's like, oh, man, like, that's why I love Kratos so much. Because you just kind of get that other perspective. But I, I think that kind of speaks to what he was going through, is maybe... From a narrative standpoint, it's like maybe he didn't feel like he needed to be on as much of an edge because things were relatively okay. Uh, you know, maybe he he could let his guard down or he, he felt like it was okay to let his guard down when in actuality he had other things that he needed to take care of. So I, I do think there are some context clues as to why perhaps Kratos feels like there's things you can come up with as a fan or for reasons why he could be this way. At, at least for this time, you know, but like at the end, he, everything's fine. He He's fully decked out. Like he's, he's good. He's good at that point. Um, you look like you want to say something. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I think narratively you're right. I think narratively it makes sense. Him, yeah. him losing his power. I think from a gameplay roguelite perspective, it's yeah. like, I would recommend someone playing these games separately, like almost playing Valhalla first, though it doesn't make sense narratively. But playing it yeah. from a gameplay perspective, because <laughs> to me, it's a better game when you don't know how powerful Kratos gets to be. It's more exciting yeah. when you unlock a new ability for Kratos when you've never experienced it before. But when you experience like 15 hours of powerful Kratos, it's disappointing when you get back into Valhalla and it's like, ah, oh, man, yeah, I have nothing. Right. And yeah. by the time I get to the <laughs> right. end here, I still really I'm, I'm still a. Uh, a shell of what I was in the in the main game, and then I'm gonna get knocked right back to zero, right? So, yeah. narratively, you're right, Gabe. There's there's justification. I get why they're doing it. I think gameplay wise, that's why it's not a roguelite to me fully. It's right. like 
It's a roguelite. It's a it's a, a action adventure game first, and a roguelite third, right? Yeah. Well, I think those roguelite elements, because I think the way they pitched it was like a roguelite experience or whatever. But like, there are moments where it's like if you want to challenge yourself, you can, you know, yeah. to move on to be able to get to tier. Like, there's those things where it's like, if you want to explore every avenue whenever you have Helios uh, instead of Mimir, like, the longer that period, like, if you let that bar go to purple, like, it gets hard. It, it gets really, really difficult. Um, yeah, so you've, you've, so you've done this already. Dude, okay. playing, yeah, playing, oh my gosh, the... The Helios segments are honestly the hardest and the worst, in my opinion. Totally. Yeah, I, um, yeah, it was, yeah. Because it's like, you know, I, in, in transparency here, I, I only died once in this game. Um, and I played on like medium difficulty. I died once instead of like getting all the way through tier and beating tier. I did, I did that every time except one time. It was like my first run when I was figuring things out. So really at the end of the day, it's like difficulty wise, it wasn't bad. I just say pressure wise, it's like, oh, like this is so hard. Um, I'm almost not having fun in these segments because it is so difficult. But in the, the day, it's like the tangible end result was that it was fine. Like the, it was yeah. balanced. I didn't die that many. I, I died once, right. right? Throughout this whole thing. Yeah. And that's, so yeah. And that's, that's kind of uh, the antithesis of what a roguelite is. Like you're supposed to die a yes. lot. <laughs> yes. So I get what you're saying. But it, at the end of the day, I think it's a really balanced experience and it's just powerful. You know, it's powerful for the medium that we love so much. And, um, you know, I, I, I've loved hearing Bush League talk about, you know, like, you know, you guys talked about Spirit Fair and like all these other games that have yeah. made you feel. And I just, it's like, yeah, man. I mean, what I really think it's important to be close to the things that make you remember what's actually important in your life and a lot of times we as humans it's right in front of our face we can't see it sometimes and we just need a little bit of nudge from another source at times to remind us like oh hey you love x y and z and this is why or you love this person or you know that like you're not a jerk like you you just you're just a little you know whatever <laughs> i just i i love video games i love what uh is happening in the gaming sphere these days and it's it's exciting i feel like we're in a really transformative time for games i am slightly worried with the way things are going with vr i think we could potentially see a a time where we're very vr centric um even more so than we are now and i that's probably a, a discussion for another time since we've been going for so long already but I like where games are at right now, and I'm very much enjoying them. Mm. And uh, you know, I I did I did have something else. We we have Jacob. You just need to come on, and we need to talk about you know this subject a little bit further because I, I feel like Valhalla touched on a lot of these subjects, and we definitely need to continue. But we have been going for quite some time, and uh, I think it'll be good if we maybe cap her here. What do you think? Yeah, let me let me finish let me finish your thought there. Okay do it. it video games are art that's it like that that is i think the summary of of what you are saying here and art is meant to move art is meant to change you art is meant to give you a perspective that you didn't have before and be that a painting a song a film art is art and i don't think you should ever have to defend that and what it means to you and what it does to you so that's totally. my summary with games that's why i love games so much is that it's i think the most powerful medium and again this is someone coming from i love music but i do think games allow you to see empathy and uh literally walk in someone else's shoes that you couldn't have walked before so right uh, that that is i think if i'm going to cap anything off here as we wrap this up um art is art and uh if something moves you that is valid and that is a good thing i think well said my friend well said ladies and gentlemen we have come to the end of our podcast this evening i want to thank you so much for tuning in i want to thank jacob for showing up and uh giving us some some good things to think about and talk about as always it's an absolute pleasure to have uh any one of the bush league gaming podcast uh come join us so thank you very much um, any future projects coming up uh, that you wanna that you wanna plug, or are you just kind of just dropping them whenever they're ready? 
every other week we 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 drop a gaming podcast i will tease since we kind of broached the topic earlier we i did announce on the most recent bush league episode that we are going to have the bush league radio show volume two uh coming up soon so my wife is a dj for the episode i got confirmation this week that she's coming back as dj dj mb uh she'll be back so we are going to do another video game radio show so that's probably the biggest tease other than that you know we've got reviews for Baldur's gate coming up uh reviews of uh whatever other game you can imagine coming out that we're usually covering it so that's that's bush league um look forward to that love it thank you so much bro um yeah go check them out uh honestly i'm gonna say this the gaming industry has become such an echo chamber of nonsense uh, with its opinions in a lot of ways, and I, I just I just can't stand it. Um, I, I resonate very little with the actual big voices in the industry because it doesn't feel I feel zero passion from them, um, and it just I, I get it. You know, you you stick in a, in a in a field for a long time, and a lot of the voices that we've had for a long time, like they're well in their tenure with their careers and you can't love something that hard for forever it's just not possible no matter how much you love something you need a break and i think we're just in a weird time where i literally don't care what anyone uh like a big voice in the gaming industry has to say because i don't agree with a lot of it like i'll hear something like i disagree wholeheartedly like i and it just makes me not want to listen to it bush league is an approachable podcast because you guys are just that vibe of just the friends sitting around the table doing a thing. Like you're not claiming to be anything. Like you're just you're just doing it. And I, I you guys are my heroes. I, I love your show, and uh, it's it's fantastic. So go go give them a, a watch or a listen, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, Appreciate as, that. Yeah, dude, for sure, for sure. Um, as for me, uh, and wannabe network, um, we. Uh, just stay tuned. You know, we're trying to be consistent. I have a couple shows out a month. I'm not really committing to anything right now. Um, we're still getting kind of settled here in the trailer. Um, <coughs> we have a new job. We're not working in the factory anymore. But I'm not going to talk about it on the record. <coughs> because legally, I don't think I can. <coughs> so if Jacob Bush is willing to stick around, I'll tell him about it. Um, but not you as a listener. I want to hear it. I know. It. It's, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about it at some point, but that time is not right. Um, so we're just, I'm just going to leave that there. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. We, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, Jacob Bush, say goodbye. Goodbye. Hey there. Whether you've stumbled upon me through my music channel, my gaming channel, or perhaps a podcast, I genuinely appreciate you taking a moment to chill out here. You know, I've got a real passion for what I do, and you know, there's just something about creating that keeps me coming back for more, and I really don't think that's ever gonna change. I'm really stoked to share this journey with all of you. If you wanna see all the various projects that I'm associated with, all those links are down in the description down below. Also, you can check out my website where I like to write stuff as well. I put a lot of sweat and love into this because I genuinely enjoy it, and it's not just work to me, it's a real passion. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for showing up today. It really means a lot, and uh, I'm going to finish playing myself out here. See you next time.